following the 18 and 30s, the main thrust of the restoration movement was an effort to unite the forces of Barton Warren Stone in uh, Kentucky and the Campbell forces in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. Following the visit of uh, Alexander Campbell to Kentucky in 18 and 24, at which time he met with uh, Martin Warren Stone in Georgetown, Kentucky, the individuals who were responsible for the efforts in Kentucky and in West Virginia place their concerted efforts in the direction of bringing these two forces together. The two individuals uh, more responsible for the original thinking outside of uh, Stone and Campbell were John T. Johnson and Raccoon John Smith. John T. Johnson uh, had been uh, a great uh, statesman in Kentucky. He had reached uh, great heights in uh, governmental affairs. He had been a member of the uh, state legislature in Kentucky, had represented the Commonwealth in the Congress of the United States, and had served as a district judge. <clears throat> But about this time, he developed a disaffection for politics because he had developed an affection for the teaching and practices advocated by Alexander Campbell. He had read not only the debates that Campbell had had, but he had read the journals that Campbell had, uh, had edited. And so in uh, 1831, Johnson left the political arena and uh, decided that he would devote himself uh, to the restoration movement. So he and his wife and uh, brother Joel <clears throat> and Joel's wife and two or three others left the Great Crossing Baptist Church in Grant County and uh, organized what Tam, what uh, Johnson said was a church of God. He decided that the system to which he had committed himself uh, showed signs of uh, sectarianism, and he decided that he would uh, affiliate himself with the teachings of Campbell. And he came to find out that Barton Warren Stone lived in the same county and was preaching for a congregation in Georgetown. So they set up communications uh, between them, which resulted in an exchange of uh, pulpits. Stone would uh, come to Great Crossings and preach in the congregation that Johnson had uh, organized, and Johnson would come in to uh, Georgetown and preach in the pulpit of the congregation that Stone had organized in 18 and 19. And as they exchanged uh, pulpits and had uh, personal and uh, corporate uh, discussions among the groups on what they were preaching and what they were practicing, they found that their similarities were far greater than any of the differences that uh, uh, were that existed uh, between and among them. So they decided, uh, the two of them, Stone and Johnson, that they would invite uh, John Rogers, who was preaching at uh, Carlisle in Nicholas County, and John Rogers preached there for 45 years, and Raccoon John Smith, who was preaching uh, in Mount Sterling uh, of uh, Montgomery County, Kentucky. So they invited uh, Stone, invited uh, Smith and uh, Rogers to join them on Christmas Day of 1831 in Georgetown 
to see if the ideas and concepts of Rogers and Smith uh, coordinated with the ideas of uh, Johnson and Stone, and they found they did. Now, Johnson was a convert of Campbell, but Rogers was a convert of Stone. So you had a, a fair representation of the ideas of uh, both the converts of Campbell and the converts of Stone. So pleased were they with their conference and the uh, progress they had made in advancing the cause. They decided they would call a larger meeting or a meeting of a larger audience to meet on January 1, 1832 at the Hill Street Church, which Stone had established in 1816, to discuss the response and reaction that uh, others would give to the proposition. Well, they met, and the meeting was uh, well attended, and attended uh, by some of the outstanding leaders of the region. After a long period of time, in this discussion, uh, Stone and uh, Smith decided that Smith would make the uh, keynote, speak, keynote speech. And after he had made it, uh, Stone arose and expressed his agreement with all that uh, Smith had said. And they shook hands on the proposition, and members of the audience uh, shook hands with one another and uh, pledged their fellowship one to another. Uh, in the cause of this great uh, restoration. And the group chose uh, John Rogers and uh, Raccoon John Smith to be the emissaries of uh, this meeting, to go among the congregations and visit with the brethren and tell them the good news of the union of uh, both of these forces. And John T. Smith, well, I mean, uh, John T. Johnson, was chosen as the treasurer of the group, and it was his responsibility to raise the money to pay the expenses of uh, Smith and uh, Rogers as they visited uh, among the, uh, the people. Now, this was a great day, a day of great joy. These individuals uh, found themselves in fellowship with one another, and uh, able to worship God in spirit and in truth together, had committed themselves to unite under the banner of Jesus Christ to, to teach and practice the things which were to be found in the Bible. This situation reminds me of uh, what I read in the New Testament about congregations uh, which were established in Judea and uh, Samaria and Galilee as the result of the preaching of the apostles during the early part of the uh, first century. And in uh, chapter 9 of the book of Acts and verse 31, the writer of the book, uh, Dr. Luke, says concerning these churches in uh, Judea and Samaria and Galilee, he said, uh, then the churches uh, had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit uh, were multiplied. Well, this is no strange thing that's happening upon the face of the earth. It is the exact replica of what had taken place during New Testament times when churches were established and found perfect fellowship uh, between and among the individuals because they were following the uh, same uh, pattern. Now, this union that was perfected uh, in uh, Lexington uh, in 1832 brought great joy to all of the adherents of the Restoration Movement, but uh, it was not long to endure. It was not long after the uh, union, uh, the unity meeting or the binding of the forces uh, together, 
that uh, some individuals arose up among them and began to advocate uh, innovations and deviations and uh, new and strange ways of carrying out some of the work of the local congregation. And when one congregation became involved in uh, the practice of innovations, of course that affected other congregations, and it was not long until uh, these disturbances uh, swept into other congregations and uh, troubled the entire brotherhood. Now, <clears throat> some of the associates uh, of Campbell in particular had advocated for a long time some sort of organization larger than the local congregation to devote its time primarily to evangelism and revivalism and to extend the cause of uh, the restoration movement into, uh, into other lands. Well, Campbell was oriented to this sort of thinking. When uh, the Brush Run Church in Bethany, West Virginia was first formed, it applied for membership and was admitted into the Redstone Baptist Association because the Campbells found greater compatibility with the Baptists of that day than they did with the Presbyterians because the Presbyterian Synod had expelled uh, Thomas Alexander from their fellowship and they found very little contact with them uh, following that time. And so the, uh, the Brush Run Church went into the Redstone Association. But uh, Campbell, Alexander Campbell, incurred the, uh, the wrath and the opposition of uh, some of the leading Baptists because of the sermon he preached on uh, uh, the law. And he contrasted the law of Moses with the law of Christ and showed that we were no longer under the law, but under the law of Christ, of grace and truth, and that disturbed them greatly. So they were in the process of bringing indictment against Campbell, but he seems to have beaten, beaten them to the draw, and uh, he had uh, taken the Wellsburg congregation that had been organized into the Mahoning Association. Now the Mahoning Association had been formed in 1820, by Adamson, Adamson Bentley and uh, uh, Sidney Rigdon uh, to bring the congregations uh, of the Western Reserve into this fellowship. Now, it wasn't long after Campbell's forces uh, uh, joined the Mahoning Association until some of the individuals, and particularly those who were influenced by Walter Scott, said this is a sectarian body. It, does not, it, it ought not to exist. It does not need to exist. All of the authority that we need is vested in the local congregations. All of the organization we need is the organization we have in the local congregation. So they proposed to abolish the Mahoning Association. Well, Campbell opposed that uh, very strongly and was going to speak out strongly against it, but Scott persuaded him to hold his peace at least uh, for the uh, time being. But by 1843, when Campbell was uh, debating in El Rice uh, in Lexington at the old Main Street Church there, John T. Johnson decided that he would get representatives from as many congregations as he could to meet during that time and discuss uh, some sort of organization and some means of cooperation between and among these congregations. And they represented pretty well all of the territory into which the restoration movement had gone. Even there were delegates from the Republic of Texas. And so Johnson proposed to them his ideas concerning cooperation and uh, the organization of some body to bind them together. But uh, Jacob Kreth, a senior, who was bitterly opposed to any organization larger than the local congregation, 
uh, raised his melodious voice in opposition to this cause and accused Johnson and the group of fostering a missionary society. Well, I suspect that's what they had in mind, but the proposition was uh, defeated uh, with the uh, opposition of uh, uh, Jacob Kreth and uh, his associates, uh, in which cause people like uh, Benjamin Franklin and others uh, joined him. But this did not stop the movement. Uh, groups uh, met in, uh, in uh, communities in Ohio near where Campbell lived and uh, where he was preaching and uh, continued uh, a consideration of this matter. Now, in the meantime, the American Christian Bible Society had been formed by David Burnett. And on January 27, 1845, this group met in Cincinnati and discussed in some great detail the kind of organization that could be formed around this American Christian Bible Society to promote uh, evangelism. This uh, amounted to little other than to motivate a meeting to be held in Cincinnati, Ohio on October 23, 1849. This meeting then, which was really a meeting of Burnett and his group, was well attended by representatives from uh, uh, most of the states where the restoration movement uh, had gone. They met at the old 4th uh, and Walnut Street Church in Cincinnati. And during that meeting, they organized the American Christian Missionary Society. Now this was the society which was to be the overall uh, organization of uh, various congregations through which uh, foreign and domestic uh, uh, missionary uh, and evangelism uh, would be uh, conducted. There was strong opposition to the forming of the uh, missionary society, but uh, the delegates chose Alexander Campbell to be the president even though he was not in attendance at that time. And then they elected a large number of uh, uh, vice presidents of the uh, organization, uh, one of which was Talbert Fanning from Tennessee. But Talbert Fanning did not accept the appointment and never did attend the meeting of it and returned to Tennessee and uh, tried to convince the congregations in that state that they should not become affiliated with the uh, Christian Missionary Society. Others who opposed the society, in addition to Jacob Kreth and uh, Talbert Fanning, were Benjamin, was Benjamin Franklin. And uh, they all spoke out uh, vehemently against this sort of digression, this sort of uh, innovation in the efforts that they had been making. Now, the churches which had been established all over the land took positions regarding the American Christian Missionary Society. And those who uh, endorsed the missionary societies came to be known as uh, society churches. And those who opposed the society came to be known as uh, uh, non-society churches. So you had the issue of the missionary society dividing the restoration movement or the congregations that had been founded under the restoration movement dividing them uh, right down the middle. Now, Ten years later than this, uh, another innovation entered into the congregations uh, that uh, further divided uh, the movement. And this uh, disturbance uh, was uh, created by the introduction of instrumental music in, uh, in worship. L.L. L. Pinkerton, who was a convert of uh, Alexander Campbell, who in addition to being an evangelist was also a, a physician and uh, is referred to often in uh, the literature as Dr. L.L. L. Pinkerton, uh, which indeed he was, had established a congregation in Midway, Kentucky in Woodford County. 
This congregation was established in 1844. And uh, the next year, Pinkerton uh, led the group in uh, organizing the Midway Female Orphan School, which became a very uh, noted organization and an important part uh, of the educational process of the early restoration movement. Now, the reason uh, uh, Pinkerton uh, influenced the church to introduce uh, a melodeon, which was a small kind of organ, into the worship was because he said that the, the singing of this congregation at Midway had degenerated to such a point that even the rats could not inhabit the building while the congregation was assembled and singing. I always thought that was an elementary uh, reasoning sort of thing, that worship and the way we worship uh, never was designed to satisfy the rats, but I think it was satisfying Pinkerton. He was the one who said that it will be an aid to our singing, it will be an expedient to our singing, and since the Bible does not condemn the use of instrumental music, then we are at liberty under the silence of the scriptures uh, to do so. Now there was great opposition within the Midway Church to the introduction of the melodeon. So great was it that Adam Hibbler, who was an elder of the church there, took uh, one of his slaves named Rufus and raised the window and put him through the window the night after it had been introduced. And they took that uh, melodeon out and took it to Hibbler's uh, hayloft and hid it away in the hayloft. Now it was supposed to have been found later and uh, brought back into the church. Uh, but now that old melodeon is in the library of the uh, Midway College in Midway, Kentucky, and can be seen by those who visit uh, that site today. Now, many of the other congregations, especially in the larger cities, like Memphis, Tennessee, and Cincinnati, Ohio, and St. Louis, Missouri, Chicago, Illinois, and Dallas, Texas, all introduce organs into their worship. And that's an interesting story if you seek out the literature and, uh, and uh, read about it. So now you have a division within the restoration movement uh, between the society and non-society churches and the organ and non-organ churches. But those who had espoused the cause of the society also accepted the innovation of the organ. Those who had opposed the society also opposed the organ. So it was really a society organ church or a non-society non-organ church. And there was great division and great opposition among many of the congregations. And the division pronounced itself exceedingly greatly. So the time finally came in about, uh, in the early part of the 1900s, in which the uh, uh, society organ churches began to call themselves the Christian church. And the non-organ, non-society congregation began to call themselves exclusively the Church of Christ. So you had the Christian church on one hand as a part of the restoration movement and the Church of Christ on the other hand as a part of the uh, restoration movement. And so pronounced was the division by 1906 that the Federal Bureau of the Census uh, changed the listing of the churches of the Restoration Movement and listed uh, some of them as Christian churches and some of them as churches of Christ. Now some of the less informed say that that was the beginning of the Church of Christ. Well, it just was not so. The Church of Christ had existed since the days of uh, Cain Ridge and many other congregations that I can name. But when the division came, uh, those who had been using the term Christian Church and, uh, and uh, Disciples of Christ intermittently and indiscriminately took the position now of society in Oregon, and that made the difference and the, the census of the Bureau uh, listed uh, them, uh, them differently. So today, we have three groups 
existing who have some claim to their roots in America back to the Restoration Movement. Now, the Church of Christ does not claim that it was established during the Restoration Movement because the Church of Christ claims to have been established on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem in 33 A.D. And the second chapter of the book of Acts bears out that claim. But then you have uh, the Christian church independent uh, and the uh, Christian church disciples of Christ. And that uh, division exists uh, within us today. Now, not only did these two issues divide the restoration movement, but during the, uh, the uh, first uh, decade of the 1900s, Liberalism crept into the pulpits. It crept into the colleges and universities that were being sponsored and financed and supported by various groups in the Restoration Movement. And this liberalism that had crept into the schoolroom at the insistence of the professors and the administrators who presided over those institutions found uh, uh, its way into the pulpits of the congregation and eventually into the uh, pews. Now, the, uh, the liberal concept of uh, the, interpreta the interpretation of the scriptures uh, originated pretty well with L.L. L. Pinkerton. He became the first liberal among them to claim that uh, uh, the Bible was... Uh, was errant. He denied the inerrancy of the Bible. He denied the uh, uh, plenary uh, inspiration of the Bible. And he uh, proposed uh, the uh, Presbyterian uh, system of organization for a local congregation. So he was the first to begin to introduce more liberal ideas and concepts into the Restoration Movement until it finally found its uh, home in the College of the Bible, which was a part of Old Kentucky University uh, in Lexington. Now, Old Kentucky University was established first in Georgetown, Kentucky in 1836 as Old Bacon College. It moved to Harrodsburg, Kentucky and remained there for a while, a part of which time uh, James Shannon, who later became president of the University of Missouri, was president of uh, Bacon College. Then later it moved to Lexington and merged with Transylvania University. And at that time, uh, the, the name was changed to Transylvania University, and four schools uh, were organized within the university. One of them was the School of the Bible, or the College of the Bible, and uh, this is where John William McGarvey appears as the instigator of the College of the Bible and the leader of it, uh, uh, the rest of his life. Well, as long as, uh, as uh, McGarvey and his associates, uh, Robert Milligan and Robert Graham and Isaiah Boone Grubbs and Charles Luce and others uh, who constituted the old guard lived, then the College of the Bible hewed the line of the early uh, restorers in teaching the Bible and the Bible only and interpreting the Bible in the light of what the Bible said. But now they began to move away from that when these old guards had uh, died out. And R.H. Crossfield was uh, named as the president of Transylvania University in, uh, in uh, 1808. Well, he was a liberal of the rankest sort liberal in education, liberal in religion, uh, and uh, most other areas that you could think of. So conflict developed between Crossweight and uh, McGarvey, and uh, between uh, Crossweight and uh, Hallar Calhoun, who had uh, been brought back to the Bible, uh, College of the Bible, in, in 1904. But, but it did not reach its zenith. It did not uh, materialize. It did not uh, show its ugly head until uh, 1917 after McGarvey had died 
and uh, Hall Calhoun had become dean of the College of the Bible when W.C. Moreau left it. And uh, then when McGarvey died in uh, 19, or, uh, 1911, then Calhoun became acting president. And here you had Calhoun, a very strong conservative, heading the College of the Bible, and you had uh, uh, R.H. Crossfield, a very strong, devout, committed liberal, heading the uh, Transylvania University. Well, Crossfield set about to bring a faculty on board that shared his liberal ideas, and he did. He brought the most liberal people, well-educated, well-trained, well-prepared to teach, but uh, of the strongest uh, liberal uh, elk that, uh, that you could find. Well, a great conflict developed between the liberals on one hand and the conservatives on the other hand. The liberals led by Crossfield and the conservatives led by Calhoun. Now, Dr. J.E. Choate and I have written this story in a volume which we call The Christian Scholar. That is the biography of Hall Laurie Calhoun, and we tell the story of him as the protege of John William McGarvey and the role he played uh, in this uh, conflict in the College of the Bible. Well, eventually, of course, the liberals uh, won the battle in the College of the Bible, and uh, Calhoun left and went to Bethany for a while, and uh, stayed there until 1925 and found that Bethany and the Bethany Christian Church were going in the direction of liberalism as he had founded in Lexington. So he resigned and went uh, back to Tennessee from whence he had come and became the minister of the Henderson, Tennessee Church of Christ and the associate, uh, the associate president with N.B. Hardiman in the, uh, in the College of the Bible. But all of the Restoration writers today will tell you that the liberals won the victory at the College of the Bible in 1917. Well, by 1927, the Christian church then divided into the Independent Christian Church and into the Disciples of Christ. And those uh, of the Independent Christian Church uh, affiliated with the American uh, 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 Association and the... Uh, Disciples of Christ became a denominational in all of its aspects and associated it to itself with the international uh, uh, society. Now let me close in these remaining uh, two or three minutes that I have and say to you that there is very little, if any, communion between the churches of Christ and the Christian churches today. Christian independent church has gone its way, the disciples of Christ has gone its way, and the churches of Christ have gone their way. And there's little fellowship and little contact among, among them. However, there are some within the churches of Christ today who are far more liberal than uh, many would have them be, and they have been advocating in uh, recent years greater fellowship with the Christian church. Forums have been organized and held. Summit meetings have been uh, uh, organized and held. And you have had uh, representatives of the churches of Christ and representatives of the Christian church meeting together in these forums uh, under the guise of talking about the likeness uh, among them and paying little or no attention at all to the differences uh, that are uh, uh, among them. Now, I see and many see no difference in the situation since these uh, meetings were organized until the uh, present time, except that the preachers within the Church of Christ are becoming more liberal more liberal in their teaching, more liberal in their conduct, more liberal in the worship, and more liberal in their fellowship. But we see no signs in the world of the Christian church moving closer to the Bible uh, as the result of these meetings. Uh, at least it's shown no sign to give up its affiliation with the uh, uh, missionary societies and uh, other innovations and particularly uh, instrumental music. 
And I would admonish you in closing that we must fight the good fight of faith if we expect to lay hold on eternal life and receive the crown of righteousness that fadeth not away in that great day that Jesus Christ shall come. Been a delight to have had these discussions with you, and I hope they may be used to the glory and honor of God and to the upbuilding of the kingdom and the strengthening of the faith of those individuals who believe the Bible today.